In this video, I'm going to discuss and demonstrate the prelude of Bach's second cello suite in D minor. As the name suggests, this is the first movement from a collection of pieces, or suite. Bach wrote a total of six suites for unaccompanied cello in the period 1717 to 1723. This is the same period as his A minor violin concerto. All the suites follow the same structure. They have a prelude followed by five movements based on Baroque dance types. If you're listening to and trying to identify a Baroque dance suite, it's worth knowing the pattern that the movements follow. An allemand is in duple time and has an anacrusis. A courant, which means running, follows the allemand. It also has an anacrusis, but is in triple time. The saraband has an emphasis on the second beat, and then you'll either have a pair of minuets, which are in simple triple time, or a pair of bourrées, which will be in duple time, or a pair of gavottes, which are also in duple time, but start with a half bar. The final movement is always a jig, which is in compound time. If you're learning to play these suites, then you'll need to make a choice about which edition you play from. Unlike the violin sonatas and partitas, we don't have a surviving autograph score, so there's a lot of debate about what Bach's true intentions were with regards to interpretation, particularly the bowing. This means there are a lot of copies that you can choose from. But the most important thing to understand when you're choosing a copy is what the editor's priority was when they were making the decisions. With this in mind, it's worth understanding the two main categories of edition, urtext and performance. An urtext edition is an attempt to communicate as faithfully as possible what the editor believes the composer's instruction was, so you can apply your understanding of style and context as uninterrupted as possible. An example of an urtext edition for the Bach um, Cello Suites is this Simon Rowland Jones edition, which you might be using. A performance edition is an attempt to make sense of those instructions and present you with a series of informed decisions about how to perform with phrasing marks, dynamics, fingerings, etc. This can be really useful, especially if you're still in the early stages of understanding performance practice of a particular era, or you have limited time to prepare a new piece. An example of a performance edition is the shiny green Watson Forbes edition that you might be using, or this one by William Primrose. Performance editions can also offer interesting evidence of changing fashions. For example, the Primrose edition that I just mentioned. Some of the suggestions are strange to modern ears, but they reveal a great deal about how he reviewed the music and how his systems of bowing and fingering worked. If this intrigues you, then IMSLP is a really good place to have a look if you'd like some more examples. Now's a good time to say that some people are a bit precious about Bach and interpretation. I vividly remember someone telling my year at Conservatoire that we should never, under any circumstances, play Bach in an interview for teaching and generally should steer clear of performing it because people have such strong opinions about how it should be played. Obviously, I took the gravity with which this was delivered to heart and spent a good number of years believing that it was fact. It's not. One of my favourite viola players, Philip Duke, says, if you make a good sound and you play well in tune, then people will listen. So my advice to you is to start with a solid foundation and then follow your instincts. Be open to changing opinions and enjoy yourself. One of the reasons I chose this prelude is that it's on the grade 8 ABRSM syllabus, so you're likely to be learning it to perform. And the other is that it's a great movement to start noticing and applying your melody language for learning because the whole piece is an exploration and celebration of contour. If we look at just the first 12 bars, you'll find examples of all the AQA terms in this bracket. Ascending, descending, stepwise, conjunct, disjunct, scalic, triadic, and arpeggio. So we start with an ascending triad or arpeggio followed by a stepwise descent that leads us into a diminished seventh. Notice that little passing note and the A. It's not in our diminished seven, but it just joins the melody. I'd like you to notice how the tie in the middle of the first two bars is shortened from a crotchet plus a semiquaver to a quaver plus a semiquaver in the third bar, and how this new rhythm becomes the rhythmic foundation of the sequence that runs from bars five to ten. Thank you. 
As I mentioned earlier, there's no surviving autograph copy of these suites, but we do have a copy made by Bach's wife, Anna Magdalena. This manuscript is titled Suites a Violoncello Solo Sans Basso, or Suites for Cello Solo Without Bass. That's not to say that these compositions don't have a bass line. One of the exciting things is how, without a separate bass instrument, Bach is able to imply a bass line using the sonority of the cello, and noticing this and drawing it out is an important aspect of performing these pieces. When I first started learning this prelude, I really struggled to name harmonic progressions, and my teacher really helped by playing the bass line while I played the written part. Here's the first 12 bars as an example. <laughs> If you'd like to explore this further, you can experiment with playing your own bass line along to your favourite recording. Start by playing the first note of the bar and sustaining it, then when it clashes, try the first note of that bar. Notice how often you need to change note. This is your first indication of the harmonic rhythm. The next passage from bar 13 is a really interesting example of how changing the octave of a note changes the effect of the melody and implies multiple voices in the harmony. This is what Bach wrote. <laughs> Notice how that seventh separates the note. He could have had the same note as a conjunct melodic motion, but by lowering the octave we hear it as a bass line. Bach keeps using this device all the way through. If you're playing this piece, experiment with switching the octave and notice how different it sounds and feels. If you're writing for a solo instrument, consider if this is a device you could apply effectively to emphasise the harmonies you're using. I'm going to skip ahead now to bar 43 and talk about one of the ways enharmonic equivalents are really useful to string players. Bach creates the illusion of a pedal A and a pedal C sharp by rhythmically repeating them in the phrase. <laughs> When you're choosing a fingering and think about the ways you most frequently play a C sharp, none of them fit well into the phrase. You don't want to be shifting between first and third position, staying in third makes the bowing a bit awkward, and your fourth finger has to work hard to make the difference in position between C sharp and G natural. But if you think of the C sharp as a D flat, then using your first finger extended back in third position becomes an obvious choice and actually works really well. The other thing that I like about this fingering is that it keeps the A as an open and that distinct timbre suits its function as a bass pedal. The last section I'd like to talk about is the closing five bars. They're written as chords, so the first thing that we want to do is to get them in tune. You're already playing a G from the bar before, so double check that's in tune with your open G. And then add your diminished fifth. And then your one on the A. Now this A, you've committed to it, you can't move it now because that's going to be a pedal all the way through to the end. be a perfect fifth compound, then hopefully you've got your one across both strings. Notice I haven't moved that D. I'm not going to move that one. And now you've got two choices of how you think about this. You'll end up playing halfway between the two. One is from your three. Mm. 
which suits your hand because it's easier to line up your three and across. And the other is from your bass. Which is slightly trickier because of the weight being in your first finger rather than higher up in your hand. So have a little experiment with that. The next thing to think about is your bowing and how you're going to sustain those chords. So I'm going to demonstrate um, just with that first one. Um, there's a famous viola player called Rivka Gulani and she talks about practicing breaking the chord multiple times. So when we break a chord, it's this. So start with one and then break it twice. And then three times. Then four. Five. And the reason that this is an effective practice method is that it encourages you to break the chord much earlier in the bow. Which means that you've got more bow left to sustain. If I break it late, it's very hard to sustain. So that's a really good way of increasing the length of time that you're able to sustain a chord. The last five bars of this piece are a really good example of how fashions have changed. If you're using the Watson Forbes edition, you'll be invited to play the final chords um, with the A at the bottom as an acciatura. If you're using the Peters edition, um, which is edited by Simon Rowan Jones, then you'll have the chords printed as they are, and then a little asterisk that suggests you make a pattern which you repeat across the bars. It's entirely up to you which you prefer. If you like the chords, then use that method of um, putting multiple breaks in the chord to extend your sustain. If you would like to do the Simon Ron and Jones version, um, then start with open strings. Because then it becomes, it becomes a simple bowing pattern. Either way, your tuning will be fundamental and the final chord will be sustained. When you're playing that final note, think about it as a word and imagine the kind of ending that that word has. Does it end with a T? Or does it end with an M? 